お時間になりました。We will now begin the symposium、uh, co hosted、uh, by the、uh, Kansai Association of Corporate Executives and the Japan Institute of International Affairs under the title 150 Years from the Major Restoration Modernization of Japan in a Global Context.、Uh, to begin with,、uh, I invite uh, Mr. Jun Sato, Chairman of the Committee on National Security of the Kansai Association of Corporate Executives. And Koichi Ai, Acting Gen Director General of JIIA, to give some opening remarks. And Mr. Sato, would you please、uh, come to the podium? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much、uh, for coming in spite of your very busy schedules. I am serving as chairman of uh, the uh, National Security Committee with the Kansai Association of Corporate Executives. And、uh, we have uh, now, uh, now holding the symposium、uh, being approached by JIIA, and、uh, we are acting as co organizer.、Uh, however, most of the work、uh, of the planning、uh, and management of the symposium has been undertaken by JIIA,、uh, Kansai. Association of Corporate Executives、uh, just helped to、uh, inform people to attend、uh, this symposium. Now,、uh, together with the、uh, Osaka Chamber of Commerce and Industry and Kansai Economic Federation, our association is one of the uh, economic uh, organizations uh, of this uh, area. And uh, uh, we have a standing a committee、uh, for more than 35 years,、uh, which is、uh, of special note. Uh, among the activities of the economic organizations、uh, here in Kansai, and namely that is、uh, the Committee on National Security, we have been、uh, actively giving recommendations、uh, on national security matters. In January of this year,、uh, we have、uh, published、uh, our most recent recommendation uh, to uh, discuss uh, the uh, state of the art or the, what should be the state of diplomacy of Japan. Today, and、uh, we point out the importance of、uh, think tanks related to、uh, foreign affairs or diplomacy.、Uh, the uh, government, uh, I believe,、uh, should、uh, make use of such think tanks, and also the think tanks、uh, should、uh, try to provide as much opportunity as possible to give the Or to, to present the ideas of the government、uh, to the public at large. And、uh, it is important, therefore, to organize、uh, symposium seminars、uh, to present such ideas and messages、uh, from the government. And uh, uh, this is such an opportunity. And、uh, we're indeed very happy、uh, to be a co organizer. At Doyukai, we not only think about the national security and the foreign affairs or diplomacy, but、uh, we Have been stressing the importance of learning the modern and contemporary history. And this symposium indeed is an opportunity to think about such t o p i c And we go back to learn once again about the history ever since the Meiji Restoration. This year marks the 150th anniversary of the Meiji Restoration. And not only do We see TV programs, but、uh, travel tours are also being organized、uh, on this note. But、uh, this should not only end as a boom, but、uh, should op provide an opportunity to seriously consider、uh, what Japan went through in the past 150 years、uh, as a guidance for Japan in the future. I hope that this will be a meaningful and fruitful symposium. I thank you very much、uh, for your attendance and for your attention. 次に、愛所長代行、よろしくお願いいたします。
150 years on from the major restoration, modernization, and Japan in a global context, the call hosted by Association of Corporate Executives and JIIA. This symposium is an opportunity to take 150th anniversary of major restoration as an opportunity to look upon the Japan's domestic policies and foreign policies in the demonization process of Japan and reconsider the significance in the international his political history, and we have invited leading scholars from Japan and the United States of modern and more recent history of Japan. Our institute uh, has uh, made a new attempt. Uh, the Japanese position in such questions have not been well understood by people in other countries, so more accurate and more effective uh, dissemination of uh, the reality uh, to the abroad, we have uh, begun uh, new initiatives. Uh, for instance, uh, well-read uh, but rarely read uh, literature in other countries are being translated into English uh, and also uh, as an opportunity to disseminate our ideas from Japan, we have organized a series of symposia. And uh, these series of initiatives uh, will be continued on into the next fiscal year. And from that point of view, the discussion we are going to have in this symposium are sure is going to give us very important indications. Uh, 150 years from Meiji Restoration, uh, and this really uh, has very important implications and suggestions for regarding what we are going to do for the domestic policies and foreign diplomacy in the future. And uh, we uh, would like to uh, uh, use the materials of the discussion today as something uh, to use uh, for dissemin disseminating our ideas to abroad through English translation. And uh, from uh, this year onward, what points of discussion need to be looked at and examined in what way, I'm sure, is going to be what we are going to learn, among others, from this symposium. Uh, our institute uh, has been organizing symposium mainly in Tokyo area, uh, but again, as a new attempt, uh, we are co-hosting this symposium with Kansai Association of Corporate Executives, as has been mentioned already. Uh, this association has a standing uh, committee on national security, and uh, since 1970s, uh, they have been addressing uh, the national security issues actively and uh, presented various recommendations regarding international situation as a business organization. Thanks to their efforts and cooperation, we are very happy uh, that we have have such a uh, rich contents of the program, if I may say so, and also we were able to have the greater leaders of Japan and abroad in this uh, symposium. And Professor Sakamoto, the keynote speaker, has uh, given a very kind recommendation about this symposium uh, to the faculty and graduate students and undergraduate students of Osaka University to attend this symposium. I hope that this is going to be a stimulating uh, session for all of you. Uh, thus, we are uh, very pleased that we are able to expand uh, uh, the activities of ours uh, toward a wider group of people. I sincerely hope that we are going to have a lively discussion today, and I hope that many more people will be interested in uh, the relationship between Japan and the other countries. Thank you very much. Sato Incho, I should... should Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Sato and the Director I. Thank you uh, very much. The next will be the keynote program. Uh, Professor Sakamoto, please come up onto the stage. Please allow me to introduce our keynote speaker. He is the professor of the graduate school at Osaka University, Professor Kazuya Sakamoto. In 2002, at Kyoto University, he acquired his PhD. Japan-U.S. relationship and the history is the area of its expertise. The security and the sort seeking for reciprocity is one of his books. He is also a member of the advisory panel on reconstruction of the legal basis for security. Uh, Professor Sakamoto, the floor is yours.
Thank you for the introduction, Sakamoto of Osaka University. I have prepared some handout. This year, 2018, in terms of our diplomacy and security, as we look back and as we think about the future, uh, this is a milestone, a special year for many reasons, because first of all, as the topic shows, this is the 150th anniversary from the Meiji Restoration in 19th century. There was the so-called Western expansion into Asian areas, but the Japanese system tried to establish a new government, tried to become an independent and self-respective country, and it is the 150th anniversary from that Meiji Restoration. In the last 150 years, we learned from the Western powers to make a constitutional government and industrial country, and eventually we had to fight with the UK and Britain, the two powers of the Western economies, and after defeat, uh, we tried to uh, contribute to the creating of a liberal global order under the value of freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. If I say so, you think it's just very rough and approximate. However, for us to think about diplomacy today and to think about the future, I think this is a significant uh, way of uh, grasping at the high level because in the case of Japan, as we can see at the framework of G7, Japan indeed is one of the leading countries that support uh, the liberal global order. The key point of diplomacy and security of our country will continue to contribute to the maintenance and development of a liberal and global order. Under that context, we shall have to maintain our security and prosperity of our country and also to try to raise our status of Japan in the global politics. So looking at the historical background, ever since the Meiji, the history of Japan and the Western powers is always the assumption of any of our thoughts related to diplomacy and security of our country. So, in fact, this is not only the 150th anniversary of Meiji, but this is the centenary after the end of the First World War. So, half a century after Meiji Restoration, which was seven years after at the end of the Meiji era. So, Japan and together with the U.S. and U.K. became the victor of the First World War. In the League of Nations made after the war, Japan was one of the permanent members of the Council and was called one of the five major powers. Technology, thought, and systems of the Western powers were introduced, promoted industry, expanded military, and tried to realize and increase the wealth of military power through the Japan-Sino War and the Russia-Japan War. We won as a result of our blood and sweat for the unequal treaties that were concluded during the Edo period. There were lots of painful effort. After all these efforts, when the World War I ended, Japan did manage to become one of the advanced countries. Japan was a victor after the post World War together with the UK and USA. But throughout the period of creating the post-war order, Japan had to confront the two countries, and then eventually it led to the major war against the two countries and against China in order to create a new order in the Asia-Pacific. There are lots of studies made, lots of discussions about the reason of this process, but 100 years have passed, and there is a meaning to rethinking about this because at least uh, for us Japanese it is quite significant, not insignificant for us to organize our thought process that is because, as I said, this is 100 years after the end of the First World War and 150 years after Meiji Restoration, but this is Heisei 30, effectively this is the last year of the Heisei era. The Meiji 150 years coincides with 100 years after the end of the First World War. That was known from 100 years ago, but that they will, will coincide with the end of the Heisei era, this is accidental. And this accident, because in Japan we use both the Christian era and the Japanese era name, and because of that, it is going to be another important year for us. It's an important milestone. So there was a major war with USA, Britain, China, and the destruction and defeat of the major wars and the defeat in Showa. The physical shock and the mental shock were huge. As for the physical shock, we managed to rebuild our country in a relatively short period during Showa. And it was not only recovery, but Japan became a major economic power that astonished the world. We became a huge economic power. Japanese people are now enjoying the prosperity much higher than what it was before the war. On top of that, Japan grew in order to cooperate 
economically to the development of other countries, but as for the mental shock, it became entangled with diplomatic matters in terms of remorse and recognition of history. So it consumed all 30 years of Heisei in order to reorganize. That is why the statement as of 2015 by the government is quite significant. Next year, when we have a new era name, according to the Japanese recognition, the Showa era is no longer an era before, but it is two era ago. Uh, then, when it comes to the historic recognition of the major wars in Showa, it will be further distant from apology and remorse, but it will be reflecting upon history in order for us to think about the future. So he said 30. That time has passed, and a new era, which will be decided next year, in terms of our thought process, I think it is quite meaningful and huge in order to follow our changes in the mindset. But ladies and gentlemen, how does war end? Of course, when the battles are over, the military confrontation between the states will be over. But for a war to be concluded in genuine term, there must be peace between the belligerencies, and therefore post-war settlement is required. What constitutes post-war settlement? There are no rules, but generally speaking, the border demarcation will be re-established, war criminals will be penalized, the compensation or the right to claim will have to be resolved, and the peace treaty or an equivalent will be concluded. In that sense, between Japan and the U.S. and Britain, that was six years after the end of the 1945 battle, according to the San Francisco People Treaty, San Francisco Peace Treaty was concluded. Vis-a-vis -vis China, between Taiwan and the Kuomintang government, there was the Japan-Taiwan Peace Treaty seven years after the end of the war, and between the Beijing government, there was the Sino-Japan Joint Statement 27 years after. Apart from the Northern Territories, the post-war settlement between USSR also has been concluded, but that is only about the legal settlement between the states, whether this uh, constitutes complete post-war settlement or not. Putting theory aside, practically that is not the case. Even states are a collective group of individuals and therefore moral post-war settlement also has to be considered. After legal uh, processing, uh, can we forget everything of the past and return to the relationship that we had in the past? That is not realistic. There are human losses and physical uh, damages that will occur during and there must be moral remorse, there must be word and deed to show the remorse and to spend the time to repair the relationship. However, the moral opposed to settlement, even more than the legal procedures, there is no definite procedures. There is nothing that says that you do this and that will complete the procedure. And if you just follow what your counterpart says, it doesn't mean uh, that all the post-war settlement has been completed, because otherwise, if that is the case, it would be no different from the legal post-war settlement. In the 1980s, between China and South Korea, uh, there was the so-called recognition of history problem, and this was related to uh, the moral post-war uh, settlement of the wars during Showa, because the Chinese and the South Korean government criticized uh, Japan. But then within Japan, there were such opinions that uh, the South Korean and the Chinese government are correct and that there's something wrong with the recognition of history among some of the Japanese people. And that is evidence that moral post-war process has not been completed. In that sense, uh, the war has not been completed. So we have to deny uh, the mistaken recognition of history in some of the people of the government, and we have to reset our diplomacy between China and South Korean government. There were some things uh, within uh, Japan, and uh, there were other camps in Japan uh, which caused a division in our country. But if we think about that, it's not that the Japanese government had a wrong, mistaken recognition about history, because it's not wrong or correct. Uh, the government was not in the position to have any a particular awareness or recognition about history about the cause of the major war in Showa. So they could have said uh, that the historical issue could be left to the historians, and the government did not have to take on that matter. But some in Japan, there were quite a few who thought that the diplomatic relationship between Japan and China and South Korea could uh, be destroyed. And uh, as a result, there was a thinking that the Japanese government should issue some uh, viewpoint which can convince uh, China and the South Korean government. And as a result, Murayama's statement is issued as 
at the 50th anniversary, if everybody had been convinced and if we could have concluded uh, the matter of history between China and South Korea, that was not the case because within a very short uh, sentence, the languages like aggression or colonial rule uh, were too easily utilized without the context. In the case of the Great Wars in Showa, it was a multilateral uh, war what Japan fought against multiple belligerencies, and it sounded as if Japan alone was the wrong party. And again, there was a strong repulsion inside Japan. If there's repulsion in Japan, again, China and South Korea will continue to criticize that the remorse by Japan is insufficient. So whether Murayama's statement is correct or wrong, again, the division in Japan became worse and deeper. As for my position is, it is not a matter of trying to close the gap or to close the difference between recognition. I think it is how to get along together with each other despite the existence of the gap. After 20 years after Murayama's statement, Abe's statement was issued, and it is superior in the sense that this aspect is understood. So putting aside whether uh, the recognition of history is the same with those of the Chinese and South Korean government, but at least uh, the Abe statement tried to show the minimum awareness of history by the government. So it is not denying Murayama's statement, it was overwriting above Murayama's statement. And the terms that were used in Murayama's statement, like aggression and colonial rule, and the historical context were made clearly. In my resume, I have extracted some of the key languages, although I do not have the time to go into detail. So the context of the terminology are made clear, and there's reference to apologies and remorse after the war in Japan. And there is gratitude to all the countries who have cooperated to Japan in order to create a peaceful world. And Japan's effort to peace was explained. And the apologies about the damage of the war is not repeated, but at least remorse will be continued. And that has been made clear. And why I think this statement was successful is the majority of the Japanese people thought that this nothing too wrong, and there is a reputable conservative critic, Shoichi Watanabe, who passed away two years ago. This critic highly appreciated it, saying 120 point scores. If Professor Watanabe says it was 120 scores, I would say the effect must have been 100 point in the score, because what was important was that the Abe statement should not have caused domestic confusion or domestic confrontation as was caused by the case of Murayama's statement. So those who opposed Murayama's statement or those who supported Murayama's statement both had to be convinced. So it was a overwriting of the Murayama statement, not denying. And as a result, what was important was, just like Professor Watanabe has strongly criticized Murayama's statement, those people also had to be convinced. As a result, uh, the Chinese government and South Korean government did not strongly criticize Abe's statement. Even if there was criticism, we could have said that this is uh, the recognition of history by the government of Japan. Mostly the Japanese people are supporting it. If there are issues, please tell us. We can explain. We are not going to repeat the apologies for the past, but we can fully explain about our remorse and reflection about the past by the government. In fact, Abe's statement has not been issued by any other country across the world. There is no country in the past that has issued this kind of statement about the recognition of history about past wars. If there are criticism by any country saying that there's a grave mistake in how Japan looks at the history of the past or if post-war a process has not been completed, you can ask back, but which country are you comparing Japan and are you com complaining or criticizing about Japan, uh, we can ask back. So talking in this uh, way regarding this recognition of history issue, not as a criticism or reflection about our past, we can think about uh, this issue to think about the future. Edward Carr, in his speech, What is History? According to the British historian, he has said that history is a dialogue between uh, the present, past, and uh, the future. So in that sense, putting aside uh, the moral issues of war, now we can talk and look back about uh, the major wars of the Shoah period. So when we think about the major war, 
course, there are many points on which we might reflect on, but uh, marking the 150th anniversary of a major restoration, I think uh, we need to renew our determination to contribute further towards the development of the world order based on uh, liberalism. And uh, uh, we uh, continue uh, to uh, reflect on this based on three points, which is uh, shown in the outline, namely a Manchurian incident, a tripartite pact, and a greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. In view of time, I will be brief. First of all, Manchurian incident. In 1931, Japan, in order to defend Japan's imperialistic rights and interests, uh, used a military force, even though it has agreed not to use uh, military force in order to to resolve international disputes three years before under the kellogg Cyprian Pact. And there was uh, worsened relations with the United States and uh, U- UK uh, over China. And uh, we went uh, to th- towards the path of war, which will not be repeated. This is uh, true for Japan. Uh, it, uh, complies with the international law. It is written in the Constitution. It has uh, been keeping this uh, pledge over 70 years. But one point that we need to reflect on is that if we cannot resolve international disputes by means of war or military force, how should we resolve the matter if talking does not do the job? If we are talking about economic interests in the international disputes, Japan is already an economic power, we might compromise or we might even give up some of our interests uh, in resolving the matter. However, what if it involves an international dispute uh, on our national security? It is allowed for us uh, to use a military force as a means of self-defense. This is allowed under the Kellogg-Brien Pact or UN Charter. And this is interpretation of the uh, government uh, that uh, it is also allowed in the Constitution. But uh, Japan actually used uh, the self-defense argument for the Manchurian incident as well. But when we look back on the uh, diplomatic and uh, security policy over the 150 years uh, from major restoration, I think uh, in the first half and second half, there was a major difference. In the first half, the self-defense concept included the safety of the uh, Korean Peninsula. But in the second half, this concept was not included. As shown in the outline, Meiji political leader uh, Yamagata Aritomo talked about sovereignty and national interests. Sovereignty, meaning territorial safety, and interests, meaning uh, defending the safety of the place closely related to the safety of the national Japan's national territory. And uh, Yamagata uh, insisted on the interests. And um, also, uh, the foreign minister, uh, Mutsu, uh, in the Sino-Jap- first Sino-Japanese uh, war, looked at the war as the war on self-defense in the sense of what Yamagata meant. And, of course, um, after that, in ever since the Korean War in 1950, uh, we have been placing importance uh, on the cooperation with the United States uh, under the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. Uh, And uh, we have been continuing uh, uh, to uh, work with the alliance although we are not able to exercise any military force for the security of the Korean Peninsula. I would like to mention two points. Some people say that you need to be able to defend one's own own country, but I believe we need to talk about uh, the economic interests uh, or the the, uh, sphere of influence uh, in the close by a neighborhood uh, when we talk about self-defense of our own country. Otherwise, it will be a half-hearted debate. And uh, uh, Japan-U.S. alliance, together with NATO, uh, forms uh, the foundation of uh, security of the free world. And in this sense, uh, the self-defense for Japan will mean the self-defense for the free world, and uh, it is tantamount to defending the world order of freedom. The second reflection that I'd like to make is a tripartite pact uh, signed in 1940. In this pact, 
Japan formed an alliance with Germany, thus becoming an enemy to the United States as well as Britain at the same time. It was quite a miscalculation to consider Germany as being a big deterrence vis-à-vis -vis United States. Japan overestimated Germany. And uh, um, my focus, however, is, is the fact that Japan formed an alliance with Nazi Germany, the worst of racist countries. In the post-war era, Japan was branded as being an ally to a country which conducted Holocaust. This is unfortunate. But at the same time, the fact that Japan formed an ally with a country having totally opposite a philosophy or sense of values was the point. In the Paris Peace Conference after the First World War, uh, Japan suggested racial equality and the principles of racial equality to be included in the uh, covenant of the League of Nations. And uh, although this was uh, prevented by uh, U.S. President uh, Wilson, however, it, 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 was, it received an agreement by China and many other countries. In those days, racism was uh, still a very big matter issue, and the fact that Japan uh, proposed uh, racial equality as a universal a sense of value was quite important. But uh, um, forming an ally with Nazi Germany ruined that reputation of Japan as being a glorious uh, uh, country, uh, placing importance on racial equality. Now, when we talk about the philosophy and the sense of values, Japan is a member of the free world, placing importance on freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. However, this was not realized in the uh, in those days uh, when Japan was an ally to Germany. So we need to redo and re-challenge to take up that uh, philosophy and sense of values once again today. And by doing so, we will be able to make a great impact an important uh, contribution because we, Japan, uh, are emphasizing freedom, democracy, and the rule of law, which were uh, sense universal values born in the West. But by sharing that uh, uh, value as a non-Western uh, country, we are able to uh, play a very important role under the framework of G7, for instance we are able to make the point that such universal values could become a truly universal by Japan being a member of that G7 group. Just having G6 countries or from the West will not be able to make that point. They truly are not able to become the leaders of the true free world. Another point of reflection is the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. With the Manchurian incident and the founding of Manchukuo, Japan was in conflict with the Western countries and uh, withdrew from the League of Nations. However, Japan made it clear by the imperial rescript that although Japan will withdraw from the League, it will not withdraw into Asia as a region and uh, will continue to have uh, friendly ties with the West. But uh, several years after that, uh, Japan placed important, started to place importance uh, on the cooperation with China and uh, started to think that uh, for that sake, uh, it may be inevitable uh, to hurt the relations with hurt the interests of the West. Or uh, once the uh, Second World War began, Japan started to say that uh, the uh, colonizers uh, should move out uh, from Asia. And of course, uh, this uh, greater uh, East Asia co-prosperity sphere uh, had, uh, of course, uh, been uh, based on uh, resentment towards the West. Uh, however, basically, Japan thought that this concept there will be will contribute to, to Japan's national security or for economic prosperity, or would uh, be conducive in raising uh, Japan's status in the world and will be of uh, national interest. However, in reality, Japan did not uh, really have the power and the capability uh, to, uh, to take care of the security of East Asia as a whole. And 
it would have been very difficult for Japan to become an economic power in the post-war era if Japan did realize the greater East Asian coast prosperity sphere. In the post-war era, Japan was able to develop economically speaking uh, because uh, it was one of it because uh, it the world developed into a global co prosperity sphere. I'm, I question the greater East Asian prosperity sphere of because it was an exclusive type of idea uh, trying to uh, build an Asian sphere that was exclusive in nature. And uh, greater East Asia was a concept uh, uh, which neglected uh, the fact that the world was becoming smaller due to globalization ever since the latter half of the 19th century. And this uh, concept uh, was based on the fact that uh, uh, Germany would lead Europe, the uh, United States would lead the Americas, and uh, Japan would lead Asia. So it was a concept that based on more or less like the uh, the uh, three kingdoms in China. And so there was uh, a problem with uh, regionalism being successful under globalization. So if Japan wanted to lead in the world, Japan should not try to become a leader in Asia. But rather, under globalization, Japan should try to utilize its uniqueness and originality to become conducive in unifying the world and becoming one of the leaders of the world so that it will be able to uh, have an honorable position in the global community. I look forward to the discussion in symposium so part one and part two. And uh, if I was to say one word about uh, 150 years from Meiji, I would uh, like to talk about independence and self-respect which uh, was an idea presented by Yukichi Fukuzawa. Meiji Japan uh, tried to build a nation based on independence and self-respect. This independence and self-respect, uh, I think, is an important slogan even today. But uh, different from Meiji era, the independence and self-respect for Japan today will be only realized uh, under the development of the free world order as one world, uh, one country in the world, we should try to sophisticate our alliance with the United States uh, by placing importance uh, on the free world order. And if we should think about uh, enriching the prosperity and the military strength, uh, this should not only be for one country of Japan, but for the whole world and the free world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sakamoto. The moderator and panelist for session one, would you please come up to the stage? Session 1, Japan as a modern state. The moderator for this session is Mr. Koichi Ai, Acting Director General of JIIA. We have two speakers, a panelist, a Professor Sumio Hatano, Professor Emeritus at University of Tsukuba, and Professor Tadae Takubo, Professor Emeritus of Kyorin University. Professor Sakamoto is going to join the panel as a commentator. Now I'd like to hand the microphone over to Mr. Ai, who is going to serve as a moderator. Hey, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And so uh, we begin session one, Japan as a modern state. Uh, 
Before that, I'd like to thank Professor Sakamoto for a very enlightening keynote speech. A hundred years from Meiji Restoration, and just in the middle of it, uh, there emerged World War I. And looking back upon 150 years, that could be considered as a watershed. And according to him, what happened before World War II, there were several actions Japan should look back seriously. And what are the significance they may have in present day? And also a post-war settlement, especially a history recognition issues, were mentioned in his speech. It was truly an eye-opening uh, speech which really massaged my brain. So including at the points he presented in the keynote speech, we hope we'll be able to have good discussion uh, in session one. In session one, uh, we have uh, Professor Hatano and Professor Takubo, and we are going to have their uh, speeches in that order. And among the uh, three uh, uh, panelists, uh, two speakers and one comedian, we are going to have discussion, and then we'd like to open the floor uh, for interactive discussion. So first, let us uh, turn to Professor Hatano, Professor Meritus at the University of Tsukuba. His uh, personal profile is given in uh, the April short. Uh, he uh, is uh, also uh, the uh, uh, Director General of uh, Japan Center for Asian Historical Records and National Archives of Japan, and he has uh, left an outstanding uh, uh, achievements as a historian and at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the Diplomatic History of Modern Japan was a very important book he uh, edited as one of the editor group. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the introduction. So I have retired from Tsukuba University. Four years have passed since the retirement. So I am at the Asia-Pacific War Archives. So from Meiji first era until 1945, there are lots of documents, official documents made by the Japanese authorities, the history official archives up until 1945, until the end of the war from 1867. Diplomatic records are managed. Uh, the documents managed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Military Records are held by the National Institute of Defense Studies and the Ministry of Defense, and uh, what is owned by the National Archives. All the documents up to 1945, all are digitalized and to make it accessible to the global community. This project started 15 years ago. And I am the DG of the National Archives of Japan. Most of the documents are in the Japanese language, but for the global researchers, I'm sure, I think we can praise that we are providing very useful documents to global researchers of Japan. Today, the topic is for the Meiji Taisho era, what a modern state was like at that time. I would like to briefly explain my viewpoint because Dr. Takubo will talk after myself. I shall try not to be duplicative. So Meiji Restoration, in order to establish a genuine modern state, the Meiji government started to be serious after the Iwakura mission to uh, Europe and the U.S. returned back to Japan. Within 10 years after the mission's return, in Japan, industrialization, modernization were implemented, as was uh, mentioned, to raise the prosperity and strengthen the military was the slogan. For the initial 10 years, it was particularly important because in the initial 10 years, as the assumption for industrialization, a centralized governance system was required. If I go into details, I will never complete my speeches because traditionally in Japan during the Edo shogunate, more than 250 Han or feudal domain uh, was the unit. Each of the Han feudal domain was like an autonomous little state. 
and the authority of the Han had to be dismantled. As the central government of Meiji, they had to centralize the power, so there was the return of the Han domain registers to the emperor and abolition of the Han to establish prefectures. In particular, abolition of the Han and establishment of prefectures, Okubo Toshimichi took the leadership. Back at that time, by the authority of Han, it had lasted for more than 300 years and to give back that authority to the central government. It must have been extremely difficult, but abolition of the Han feudal domain establishment of prefectures was executed. Another point is about the military power. Traditionally, it was decentralized to different Han, but the military power was also to be centralized under the central government. This cannot be done overnight. However, centralization of military power was implemented as one of the reasons or trigger was, of course, for each of the Han feudal domain, that the military had to be concentrated under the central government step by step. But what was more important was the conscription ordinance issued in 1873. So it was implemented and the military, it was not the military of each of the Han, not about the Tokugawa shogunate, it became the military power for the population. The central government now had the control of a unified military and to govern the military. It was important to centralize under the central government. The fiscal stabilization was another important aspect. After all, the fiscal management was distributed across the different hands, and the tax system, the fiscal administration by the central government was never stable. Without financial means, the central government has no power to wield, and therefore fiscal stabilization was required. What could be done? There was annual the taxes, the landowners for each of the Han, but the annual tax was collected, and that was the revenue for the Han. And the Han, in turn, would pay the uh, taxes to the Edo shogunate. This system was strongly influenced by the weather. Uh, the harvest result. It was very unstable, and therefore the land tax reform was implemented. Year after year, in order to ensure stable tax revenue, land tax reform was implemented. And because of this, the fiscal stability improved at the central government level, a planned a budgetary distribution and allocation became possible. There are other factors, but Han's authority was dismantled, military power was centralized, the fiscal stability was ensured. Another part is about compulsory education. Compulsory mandatory education system was established. Already the education system was implemented in 1872. Ordinance for education was also issued. Normally, from higher education, expansion is implemented. But in the case of Japan, it started from the primary school level. Uh, making it compulsory started not at the higher education, but started from the primary education system. So I think this has a big relevance with uh, the centralization of the government. Each and every Japanese citizen is expected to have a min minimum level of education in the earlier years and for the modernization of Japan in the future. Uh, this, I think, was very important as a strong foundation for the Japanese population. So, in order to centralize the power at the government, each pieces of reform were implemented step by step, and eventually it culminated in the establishment of the Meiji Constitution of 1889. 
this uh, constitution of 1889, there was some 10 or 20 years before it converged into the Meiji constitution. Throughout this period, the heritage asset to be handed over to future generations by the Meiji government was established. First of all, the 1889 constitution, before that the cabinet system had been established, but before that and on top of that, the Meiji constitution was established in 1889. In terms of the heritage of the Meiji government, it is indeed uh, the heritage of the Meiji constitution. And there is one point I would like to discuss. In terms of the development of Japan onwards, one comment about the Meiji Constitution. In Japan, the concept of absolute monarchy did not exist. During the Edo period, or even before Edo, there was no concept of absolute monarchy. Unlike the Western powers, Japan did not have that concept. And uh, therefore, in order to implement a Western type of constitutional monarchy, uh, the emperor, as the absolute monarch, had to be envisioned. So an absolute monarch had to be created, installed, and impose restrictions on uh, the exercise of the power by the emperor. So the concept of absolute monarch had to be introduced, installed, established, which in the case of Japan was the emperor, and the supreme authority of the emperor was expected that the emperor himself would restrict exercise his supreme authority. That was a logical framework. Therefore, the Meiji constitution has dual characteristics in the sense that it is both constitutional monarchy and absolute monarchy. I think that is one characteristic of the Meiji constitution. In order to apply uh, this constitution uh, by the government, so it was applied under the basis that it is based on the constitution monarchy of the emperor, but sometimes they try to employ the concept of absolute monarchy, which is at the time of the start of the Pacific War, the Tojo government. I think that was a particular timing. So constitutional monarch, the emperor, and the absolute monarch emperor, there were two characteristics, and there was an ambiguity in terms of applying or operating under this Meiji constitution. Of course, it is related to the supreme authority, and which would be discussed by uh, Dr. Takubo. Another point related to the uh, Constitution, uh, the tradition of public debate and public opinion. Already during the Edo period, Edo Shogunate, concentration of power was to be uh, suppressed and already a collegiate uh, system was established as uh, we know. This was transferred to the Meiji government, although there were ups and turns, but eventually, as the parliamentary politics of Japan, it was established. So a collegiate system or consensus-based decision-making that opinions of as many people as possible would be collected in order to make a decision based on the consensus already that existed in the Edo shogunate. And to the Meiji government, that was transferred, and that led to uh, the parliamentary system under the Meiji constitution. For uh, Japan, as we think about the future political party system, this did have a profound uh, meaning. Another point which is not related to the constitution, during the Meiji uh, period, to create an autonomous, independent capitalism. In the case of Japan, why capitalism was able to be established in Meiji Japan? There are lots of studies, observations, and viewpoints 
But the characteristic of the Japanese capitalism uh, was during the Meiji time, it was capitalism not to be dependent on uh, the Western uh, countries. During the Edo shogunate, uh, already the merchants who supported uh, the commerce in the future, like Shibasawa Eiichi, Iwasaki Asaburo, uh, these major uh, merchants supported uh, the businesses in Japan. Uh, but the government had a viewpoint to cultivate uh, capitalism. So number one, not to depend on other countries' capital. That was the first point. So. Japan pursued autonomous independent capitalism, for example, in the case of China or European countries, they were very different in that sense from what Japan tried to do. So this, I think, is the third characteristic of the Meiji government. So autonomous independent capitalism means not to depend on Western powers, and how could this be realized and what happened was promotion of industry. So the central government led the introduction of advanced industry. This was a government-led business. As I mentioned, uh, there must be stable tax revenue, and the land tax reform was implemented. Plus, another important point is treaty revision was realized by the end of Meiji, uh, but until the very end, what the Japanese government strongly it said was that foreigners will not have access to uh, the inland part of Japan. Eventually, uh, they would concede, but for non-Japanese to do their business in the inland of Japan, Japan resisted until the end because this was required for Japan uh, to be autonomous, autonomously capitalistic. Another factor to be independent a capitalist country, there were some civil wars, but until the Sino-Japan War of 1891, there was no major war. Japan avoided major war. The maintenance of peace was another required factor in order to enable Japan to become an autonomous capitalist country. But after the Sino-Japan War ended, the treaties were revised and tariff autonomy was recovered. And then, rather than autonomous capitalism, it turns to global uh, capitalism uh, to introduce a foreign capital and to develop uh, the Japanese capitalism. There is a shift in the uh, perception or direction, and on top of that, uh, the acquisition of uh, foreign colonies started. I am checking myself on the time, but my last point. So for most of the Meiji period, which is spending as long as 50 years, Japan completed revising the unequal treaties. But so the 50 years experience of <coughs> the 50 years of trying to revise the treaties, my area of expertise is uh, diplomatic history. So for the 50 years, that experience of trying to revise their treaties, I would like to conclude by saying what lesson it was for Japan. So first of all, at the final stage of revising the treaties, Mutsu Munemitsu government, the Japanese parliament had a very strong line attitude towards the foreign powers. The government's effort to revise the treaties was strongly uh, criticized by the Japanese parliament. That is, there were hardline opinion by the people, and it blocked uh, the careful approach by the government. That kind of structure was established. On the one hand, the government was rather hesitant and careful, but the people in the private sector, uh, the public opinion, were hardline. Uh, this hardline or soft structure was established. The government continued to be careful and hesitant, but the people continued to be hardline. And that kind of situation structure continued in the case of Japan, mainly by the parliamentarians. Another point is throughout uh, the negotiation of revising the treaties. In a competitive global community, uh, the goal was to constantly raise the status of our own country. 
So that is the style of external relation. Revising the treaties, after all, was required for Japan to become a member of the civilized world. Japan was very active, worked hard to revise the treaties, but in order to be a power in the world, Japan had to be competitive, needed to raise the status. So whilst international collaboration was the principle, international collaboration was the principle, there was a flexible adaptation to the changes in the global environment. So this was extremely pragmatic. Throughout the effort, negotiation of amending the treaties, Japan learned a very adaptive, flexible, pragmatic way of conduct. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Hatano. Now let us turn to Professor Tadae Takubo, a professor emeritus of Kyoto University. Uh, professor uh, Takubo uh, worked uh, in uh, Juji Press, uh, and uh, he entered uh, Kyoto University as uh, a professor. And uh, at the moment, uh, he is a, a vice president of Japan Institute for National Fund Fundamentals. Thank you. Uh, I am Takubo. Uh, Professor Hatano has given us a beautiful talk. I'm quite a lay person, and I don't think there's anything I could meaningfully add. But as a lay person, I would like to uh, try to make my observations from a slightly different perspective. One of the purposes of such a symposium is to look at the views of history, uh, especially the views of history uh, which might uh, be different among Japanese people, for instance, comfort women issue that was first brought up by some Japanese people, some say. So among the Japanese people themselves, there were some ambiguities pending from the end of World War II, and there has been no clear-cut approach to this. And about the uh, view of history, if there are 10 people, all the 10 people have uh, different uh, views of history. And uh, Victor uh, Nation's uh, view of history is different from uh, that of a vanquished nation. To unify a, a view of history uh, under a certain rule is uh, quite difficult. As a ceremony, there was a, a Tokyo tribunal, and uh, the result was uh, yes, the uh, cooperation coordination could be made, uh, but the final uh, settlement or resolution is diff diff difficult. Uh, Mr. Kyose uh, mentioned at the outset that the opening statement uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Parr, uh, Judge Parr made a very important uh, point, and they cannot be suppressed. And uh, there are differences on the views of history, and there are different ways of thinking. And so, if each one of us stick to one's perspective, what we can uh, do is to try to understand uh, each other's perspective of history. Then uh, that will lead to some fruitful discussion. And I think we should keep up on trying to unify a, a, a view of history. Uh, three or four years ago, the uh, Sanke Shimbu newspaper uh, established the uh, People's uh, Constitution Drafting Committee. As a newspaper company, it I tried to uh, take a look at the Japanese constitution and established this uh, committee, uh, a, a People's Constitution Drafting Committee. And one of the uh, big issues uh, was about the preface of the constitution, uh, how Japan as a state is viewed. Uh, in the Constitution. Some say that such a thing shouldn't be written in the Constitution, but unless we understand what uh, the state uh, of Japan as a state is like, um, uh, it will be difficult for us to move forward. So a lot of discussion took place on uh, the preface of the Japanese Constitution. So as Kuzo uh, Yukichi mentioned, uh, the independence and the self-respect. Uh, and one more word, moral, uh, moral state of uh, independence and self-respect is the vision of uh, Japan as a state. Uh, we had 2,000 years of history, uh, 
as a backdrop to such an ideal vision, and that is the discussion we had in that uh, committee meetings. 150 years since major restoration, yes. Uh, uh, but concerning it, uh, the Japanese constitution, I have been doing a lot of studies. Uh, I have been one of uh, the uh, leading revisionists of the constitution. Should we consider a constitution revision based upon the Meiji constitution? Uh, as uh, Professor Hatano mentioned, someone like an absolute monarchy. And uh, some people may think that we are trying to establish the emperor as an absolute monarchy and uh, reinstate him uh, to the power uh, and try to send the troops to every corner of the globe. Of course, um, uh, that is uh, 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 not at all true. There are so many people who make up those uh, nonsense. A little over 10 years ago, uh, Mr. Kiro Mori, uh, in Se Chireme, uh, New Party, uh, mentioned as follows. Uh, Japan is a divine country centered around uh, the emperor. Uh, and except for Sanke, a newspaper, all the press in Japan criticized him heavily. Uh, wasn't Japan a divine state centered around emperor? Wasn't that Japan like in the past? Uh, the imperial family uh, over 2000 uh, uh, has uh, produced Emperor Tenno uh, out of the direct descendants, the male descendants of the family. And Emperor had both power and authority, but from a narrow period, uh, these two things, the power and authority, got divided. Uh, power on one hand and authority on the other, uh, Ken Doku and Ken Yi, as Professor Hatano mentioned. Uh, there are various exceptions. Uh, uh, for instance, in Europe they had uh, conquest the kings, but unlike them, uh, the Japanese emperors have been serving as priest kings. Even before the import of uh, uh, Buddhism, we used to have uh, the uh, proto Shintoism and uh, uh, Tenno, uh, uh, and Imperial Family relates to. Uh, Shintoism, and I think imperial family is at the head of the Shinto tradition, and uh, that continued for 2,000 years, but from another uh, period, uh, the divide began between uh, the uh, authority and power. Um, uh, well, uh, priest king, uh, uh, the uh, Tenno as an authority, uh, has continued over years, except for certain periods of time. Uh, uh, but power uh, was uh, given uh, more or less to, to samurai uh, Fujiwara uh, family from Nara period, I think, was the first group of people who got uh, power. And uh, Heishi and Kamakura and Edo period continued over 200 years, and uh, it led to Meiji Restoration. In that big uh, development of history, uh, many events have happened, and we are still on the extension of that long history. So power and authority. What happened to major restoration? The power uh, uh, was really uh, lost. Uh, there was uh, no political control over a, a power. And if uh, anyone could exert control, there was a big pressure from uh, Western powers. Uh, enormous uh, pressure from Western powers were hitting Japan. So, uh, a shogunate a power was lost, and the power was converged upon the emperor in Meiji, and I think that is how the crisis was overcome uh, in Meiji Restoration time. Uh, and uh, uh, Professor Hatano is an expert on uh, the history of Japan, and uh, 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 as we understand, uh, Saigo and Okubo, there was a great talent pool among the leaders in Japan back in those days. And as I study international relations, I would like to take note of the Crimean War. Uh, that is three years before the arrival of uh, Kurofune. Uh, uh, Britain and France versus Russia uh, and also Ottoman Empire, they fought the Crimean War. Uh, 
a little over 10 years ago uh, in Kamchatka Peninsula, I had a chance to visit and uh, to see there a, uh, a fort, and that was a site uh, of a fight uh, in the Crimean War. So Crimean War was truly a big, uh, almost a global war. And uh, during the Crimean War was uh, being fought, um, uh, the uh, Akumada Perry arrived in Japan. Uh, and uh, uh, it was such a big shock, and uh, the shogunate was uh, overthrown. This uh, Crimean War was fought, and uh, Akumada Perry arrived in Japan, and he went back. Uh, and seven or eight years later, uh, in, in America, a civil war was waged, and it still has a very excruciating uh, legacy in the mindset of Americans. So there was such a, a big uh, foreign uh, pressure and shock uh, to Japanese people. Uh, but in such circumstances, a uh, big enterprise of uh, Meiji restoration was accomplished, and that was uh, the approach taken uh, to overcome such a crisis in the face of Western powers. Now about uh, the form of a state. What kind of government did we have in Meiji era? There could be many analyses we can make. And uh, Professor Emeritus at Tokyo University, Sukehiro Hirakawa, uh, did an in-depth study on this point. Uh, the uh, charter author of five articles, uh, he called it a national code, and I agree with his analysis in this regard. I think uh, many of you have learned this. Uh, I learned certainly uh, this uh, charter oath uh, when I was in elementary school. Uh, one thing, it talks about the democracy. We should have a, a wide uh, a public debate and everything should be uh, decided uh, in uh, the uh, discussion. Uh, that's Article 1 and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, not just the elite but uh, the commoners should unify uh, their spirit. And uh, uh, Articles 4 and 5 are very important. We should break through a old customs. We should do away with the old conventions. Uh, we should consider internationalization or uh, globalization. Uh, we should break through uh, old conventions. Uh, and we should uh, seek universal values. Uh, which what we know today include uh, the democracy, our liberalism, uh, human rights uh, uh, was uh, discussed uh, in this article. And number five is knowledge shall be sought throughout the world so as to strengthen the foundation of imperial rule. And I believe that this charter also five articles really showed how the state should be like after Meiji era. And what happened after that is something we should learn from the speakers in the session two. And I think this discussion should continue as we move forward. But there might be some flaws or erroneous uh, things done uh, in Meiji government. Uh, a little before Manchurian incident, the Japanese invasion uh, began, uh, uh, and some people call it the 15 years war. Uh, and some leftists say that this is a conspiracy. And uh, for 15 years, um, it's like a Nuremberg Tribunal. Uh, uh, Hitler was uh, the person who caused such a hebug. But in Japan, there were so many succession of uh, cabinets. And uh, uh, a prime minister, I forgot his name, but uh, he stated that uh, there was no conspiracy. Uh, and uh, I believe that Tokyo Tribunal was a tribunal that really showed uh, the absence of such conspiracy. Uh, it's really outrageous and nonsense. Uh, but uh, uh, when we consider the uh, Charter also Five Articles, uh, uh, there were some flaws uh, in the Meiji Constitution uh, and uh, some uh, wrong uh, events took place uh, in Washington. Uh, 
Naval Conference, that's one, but in the fifth year of Ashura in 1930, a London Naval Conference was held to reduce the, or to limit the tonnage, and uh, a Japanese ambassador uh, in London a meeting presented the number, and he agreed with uh, other countries. And uh, uh, Hatoya Michiro, when he was young, took this up as a possible encro encroachment of the, the Supreme Command uh, of uh, the Army and uh, Navy. And uh, in Meiji uh, Constitution, uh, there is, an, uh, I think that was perhaps in Article 3, um, that shows uh, the Emperor is in, uh, sacred and inviolable. And uh, this is not really uh, looking at Emperor as someone uh, divine. Uh, it is a kind of uh, um, uh, article for immunity. Uh, uh, yes, on uh, the uh, document which required resolution, uh, Emperor signed. Uh, but uh, as a constitutional monarchy state, uh, care uh, was uh, taken so that uh, the uh, Emperor was not really held responsible for uh, the signatures he uh, placed upon uh, the decision. So it's not that he was made divine. And it also says in the Meiji Constitution that the Emperor uh, combined in himself the rights of uh, uh, sovereign. And the uh, uh, Emperor also has uh, the supreme command of the Navy and uh, Army. Uh, but actually, the supreme command of the Navy and Army uh, were uh, uh, given or somewhat assisted uh, by uh, the uh, chiefs uh, of uh, uh, Naval and uh, Army general staff. Uh, and uh, despite uh, this uh, supreme command of Navy and Army, uh, the, the Japanese representative agreed to uh, enable uh, tonnage uh, reduction in the uh, Naval Conference in uh, London, and that made a very big issue in Japan. Uh, uh, Maruzo, who were in Siberia for over 10 years, uh, he was uh, the uh, chief of uh, the uh, general staff uh, of uh, Kanto or army, and he was uh, made a prisoner of war in Siberia. And some say that he was a, a spy, but uh, I, I had uh, been on good terms with him, and he was a really wonderful person. Uh, uh, he spent four year, hours uh, in Harvard University about this issue of a supreme uh, uh, command. Uh, and uh, uh, the chiefs of uh, Navy and the Army general staff were actually exercising their rights, and uh, there were some uh, changes in the cabinets. Uh, the Prime Minister and uh, Ministers of Army uh, and the Navy also shared some rights and uh, powers. So, on the other hand, uh, the Gendo, uh, the elderly statements, uh, they were uh, samurai in Edo era. Uh, they risked their life and they survived through turbulent ages. Uh, and they looked at the whole world. And on behalf of Emperor Meiji, they Elder statesmen more or less shared uh, the exercise of power. Uh, they were great, talented, uh, wonderful uh, people. But gradually, uh, the elderly uh, statesman passed away. Uh, the last person left was Sayonji, and uh, he was more or less a figurehead as an elder statesman, only appointing the next uh, prime minister. So there wasn't uh, enough uh, talent left in the Japanese political situation. In Anse no Taigoku incident, uh, Hashimoto Sanai uh, was one of them who perished. Uh, he went to uh, Edo uh, to exchange discussion with uh, uh, Saigo. Uh, and after discussing with Hashimoto Sanai, the top priority uh, for Japan uh, in Edo at the time was the Russian uh, menace, uh, British menace. And if a uh, British uh, was a bigger menace, then uh, the Japan should uh, ally with uh, the Russia. Uh, and uh, that was the advice from Hashimoto Sanai, and the cycle was really supposed to hear this. Uh, 
uh, there were many uh, minor issues which were addressed. Uh, uh, but when Japan was in the middle of a big uh, shift in the world, uh, there were so many great talents in Japan who tried to consider what is the course Japan should be uh, heading in. And uh, those are uh, elderly statesmen. Uh, when they were all uh, gone, uh, who got the power? Uh, for instance, the chief of uh, Navy and Army General Staff in, in Cabinet, uh, Prime Minister and the Ministers of the Army and uh, uh, Navy. So uh, the five leaders shared the power, and uh, no one was really sure where the actual uh, command uh, resided. And that was the greatest tragedy, I believe. And uh, uh, that was discussed by uh, the, the professor I mentioned earlier, taking about four hours at Harvard University. And uh, I just uh, forget the name, but a publishing company established by uh, Konosuke Mazushita uh, published his uh, book. Uh, and that was a tragedy. And the historians uh, could explain many things out of such a development, and there could be various uh, uh, arguments against this. I hope that you wouldn't misunderstand me, but regarding the issue of the extreme command of the Navy and Army, um, uh, it seems that uh, Article 9 uh, of the current Japanese constitution is an extreme uh, end of uh, going uh, opposite from uh, this. Uh, no uh, right of uh, belligerency, uh, uh, no military force. Uh, and uh, through various uh, rhetorics, we managed to keep uh, the forces in Japan. Uh, but for instance, uh, what happens if the um, fishermen with arms arrived on the Japanese uh, coast? Uh, what, if, what happens if anything happens in the Korean Peninsula? There are abductees. Uh, are we going to just sit idle doing nothing? And later, are we going to pay some money? Uh, saying that we are going to pay for the reconstruction of the damaged Korean Peninsula, is that what we are going to do? And I think we have gone to such a too much extreme uh, in doing a lot of uh, serious critical reflection upon what was done uh, in the war period in Japan. I think the time is up. I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. え、高尾先生ありがとうございました。え、それでは、あの、今の2人のお話を受けて、あの、作物先生の方。え、I think it is indeed a superb summary of uh, what we are talking about. Uh, Professor Takubo talked about the uh, form of the state and uh, the constitutional monarchy and also the importance of the uh, Charter Oath. And uh, ultimately, uh, he talked about uh, the issues of a Meiji uh, constitution, uh, but uh, uh, he also talked about uh, uh, the importance of uh, uh, com revising the direction uh, from uh, where we were. And we were at the 100 years after the Meiji Restoration. I think uh, how we viewed uh, uh, Meiji has changed. Uh, Ryotaro Shiba wrote many books about Meiji, and as a result of that, uh, he uh, appreciated what happened during Meiji very highly. And because there was uh, such a high appraisal of uh, Meiji, uh, he tended to neglect what happened in Showa, which was uh, a problem in my view. But uh, looking back uh, at uh, Meiji, as the two panelists mentioned, uh, the Meiji constitution system 
was uh, said to have had some problems. But I believe uh, everything has its problems. And uh, of course, uh, you may talk about uh, the backwardness of the Meiji society, but uh, that is comparative in nature. But uh, since it was rather backward, uh, perhaps uh, that was the reason why Japan went to war. And uh, I think uh, Professor Takubo talked about the Supreme Command. Then, of course, uh, uh, the independence of the Supreme Command uh, uh, was uh, established so that the military would not become involved in politics. But uh, things changed, and the military went on its own. and. Uh, uh, created uh, uh, the difficult situation for Japan. So the question is uh, whether that was an issue or at the time of 100 years after Meiji uh, restoration, uh, Fusao Hayashi um, uh, talked about uh, um, the the Great East Asia War and uh, what was good about it. And uh, Japan's response to uh, West uh, ex ex exercising greater influence in Asia had to be countered in one way or another. And uh, so whether the uh, uh, political situation was backward or not, uh, that was not the reason why Japan had to respond. I would like to uh, elaborate on that a little later. but. As we look back on 150 years from major restoration, the external environment that Japan faced was that uh, while the world was becoming smaller, the question was uh, who was, which was the country which was to uh, take the lead in the world. And uh, after the world, First World War, uh, I believe uh, there were new ideas in society. And in case of Japan, uh, Hayashi Fusao talked about uh, the clash of civilization in one sort or another. And uh, so uh, there were different levels of uh, battles that need to be fought. And uh, if the Meiji constitution era was so outstanding, uh, would, it, would it have been able to prevent that from happening? That's another question. In building a modern state, of course, uh, Meiji people understood that democracy was important. But uh, when we think about the form of the state or uh, the uh, political situation, it needs to be based on history. It is not possible all of a sudden to, uh, try to uh, bring in the um, uh, British uh, democracy, for instance, uh, of uh, in uh, Europe, uh, the Meiji Constitution was appreciated quite highly, but uh, after that, some time, the question was why people started to doubt about uh, the uh, importance of the Meiji Constitution. After all, that needs to be questioned, and people started to change it change their mind. I tend to agree what had been said, but regarding the um, uh, negotiations of the treaty revision, there were hardliners and uh, uh, people who tended to go along with the uh, foreign ideas. That sort of uh, uh, Disagreement was not something that was bad. Of course, the question is why there was such a debate. And I would like to ask you questions about that. When you conduct uh, foreign relations, you can't with the, you can say uh, or draw compromises from the other party by saying that uh, since we do have difficult domestic situations, would you please compromise? And uh, uh, even though there has been domestic conflict, uh, there probably was uh, some uh, friction of civilization after all. So what do you think about that idea? Professor Takubo, as well as uh, Professor Hatano, I would like to ask you these questions. Professor Hatano said that, uh, um, of course, uh, 
uh, this di discussion and debate is a part, important part of democracy, but democracy basically means that the leader is uh, uh, elected by the public at large. And uh, uh, having uh, discussion and debate, if the leader had been uh, chosen from the be beginning, uh, uh, by the public, it may uh, lead uh, to a situation where people will be satisfied. But when we talk about uh, a pre-war democracy, in those days, I think uh, the situation was still immature. And during, I think this is related to the uh, political party system uh, during the Taisho period. But uh, 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 in terms of uh, constitutional monarchy, I think uh, two or three years ago, um, oh, uh, on a, a certain paper was put out uh, related to independent revolution, uh, saying that uh, uh, there should not have been an independent revolution. After all, it was bad because uh, war of independence, if the, there was no war and uh, uh, if uh, the situation continued, uh, the uh, emancipation of the slaves would not have been such delayed and the Indians would have been um, much better off. Uh, but uh, uh, this is uh, before uh, ha having President Trump, uh, but uh, uh, also uh, the uh, is, he said that uh, we would not have uh, had to choose uh, such a bad president. But in terms of republic, uh, if the it would have been such a, a, a big uh, trouble uh, if we, we uh, if we people had to elect uh, kings as well. So um, uh, constitutional uh, uh, monarchy, uh, I think, has its good points as well as bad points. Uh, but uh, all in all, I think uh, there are examples um, uh, which point to the good points of the constitutional monarchy, and. Uh, democracy for us is something that is uh, very important and we cannot do away with it. But among uh, there are people like uh, Tanaka Kotaro who says that the uh, Tenno uh, Emperor system uh, needs to be maintained for the sake of democracy. And I tended to agree with him. And looking at the situation in the United States today, I if you tend to feel more and more that this is true. So I tried to point out uh, the issue related to democracy and uh, also uh, like to question whether we went to war because of the uh, major constitution situation uh, being uh, not good. Thank you. First, about the Meiji Constitution and the flaws about the supreme command that is independent. The prerogative of the supreme command, the land, sea, and air forces, are the authority to lead the troops, that it is outside the command of the cabinet. So, as the country entered the Showa region, and as the army, the military became the stronger, the military started to pull other politics. At hindsight, it does look that it was a negative impact, but the supreme command that it was established under the Meiji constitution, what was envisioned uh, was uh, that rather than the military inter fearing in the politics, the military activities at back at that time, that the military, if it is restricted by the political parties, consistency of the military would be undermined. So rather than the military wanting to interfere in the politics, there was a concern that the political parties could be a restriction over the military that the uh, politics, whenever the cabinet changes, the government policy changes, and the military activities in consistency may occur. That, I think, was the way of thinking back then. During the Meiji, Taisho, and to the beginning of the Showa era, it was not 
such a serious issue, I think. But after that, after 1931, after Manchurian incident, I think the operation or the application went wrong, particularly in China. The military sort of tried to have a control over the central government because the local field armies are under the supreme command. So at hindsight, there seems to have been something wrong about the military's power and authority in China. About the amendment of the treaties, I did not explain fully. At the final stage of revising, so at the timing of the Sino-Japan War, just immediately before uh, the war between China started, uh, the negotiation was about to be completed, but it was back at that time, as Professor Sakamoto mentioned, through negotiating the change of the treaties, how should I explain? But as a modern country, I think the country has started to mature. The public opinion, in particular the members of the parliament, there was an active debate, and as the government tried to negotiate the treaties, the government was very careful. The government tried to comply with the principle of international collaboration, but the parliamentarians were adamant because it was the most important goal of the country back then. And the parliament tried to push with the amendment of the treaty. So between the parliament and the uh, government, uh, there was a healthy tension. And the country was starting to become mature as a modern state. I think that would be my observation. I would like to make three points about democracy, uh, deliberative uh, discussion, uh, and decisions should be made through public uh, debate. And uh, Admiral Major, I think, stated this as a principle to follow. Uh, and uh, the ideal democracy, of course, could be made overnight, but he established this as a big a goal, and that is why I think that can be regarded as a national code of conduct. And second point about the constitutional monarchy system. Uh, one young scholar of a political scientist, when we ask him uh, what the kind of uh, state that Japan has at the moment, and he cannot really answer. I really want them uh, to speak clearly in answering this question. Uh, and it's indeed uh, the constitutional monarchy, and those countries with constitutional monarchy are politically stable. They might be small in scale, but they are quite laudable states. And I think we should be proud of our country being a country of a constitutional monarchy. And Tendo, the emperor, has been historically a priest king, no effort to oppress the people. There were no changes of the dynasties, revolution after revolution. The Tendo system has been continuing through a male descendant line. And that that is how our constitutional monarchy uh, is all about. And now, uh, uh, democracy uh, committed uh, doesn't use the word tendose, but uh, we call it the imperial household. Uh, and uh, a former member uh, of a former Socialist Party of Japan, uh, Mr. Umezawa, a member of the, the Communist Party Secretariat, he is now a university professor. He uh, wrote a book entitled uh, Emperor uh, as a Socialist. Uh, committed on, issued a statement, and uh, uh, they uh, challenged the Japanese Communist Party to overthrow Tenno system. And Osano Kaku, a professor at Watan 
Waseda University and uh, Watanabe Teishi, uh, chairman of the Japanese Communist Party, receiving this order from Komintero, decided to withdraw from uh, the Communist Party, uh, and he converted into a different uh, uh, thought line. And uh, they are quite uh, refreshing as I read uh, those statements when uh, they withdrew from the Communist Party. And it seems that Japanese public opinion really uh, respects uh, the imperial household. Uh, for instance, Kagawa Toyohiko. He was a Christian and a member of the Socialist Party. Uh, uh, when a Socialist Party was made for the first time after the end of World War II, and in a big excitement, in the middle of the hall, uh, he stood up and cried uh, that hail to Tenno. Uh, all the Socialist Party members were really surprised, but uh, most of uh, the members uh, there uh, didn't feel uncomfortable about it. And uh, another uh, chairperson of the Japanese Communist Party who was assassinated, uh, Asanuma, uh, he uh, uh, offered prayer uh, to the uh, shrine uh, altar and also to the Buddhist altar. Uh, and uh, there were so many... Uh, episodes uh, written down uh, about Mr. Asanuma left by Umezawa, uh, about his uh, reverence of uh, the emperor. Uh, so, unlike uh, uh, the discussion from the leftist uh, 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 critics, it's not that we should do away with the Tenno. There are uh, deeper meanings into Tenno and the imperial household. Thank you very much. Now we would like to entertain, oh, before entertaining questions uh, from the floor, uh, may I mention two points. Professor Takubo's uh, question. First of all, I think you mentioned uh, that uh, under the Meiji Constitution, uh, there have been uh, some problems related to the role that the emperor played, uh, but uh, the uh, uh, power was uh, uh, divided uh, into uh, various uh, parties uh, with the leaving of the elder statements, statesmen. Then, um, when we look at the Meiji Constitution, um, there were many uh, uh, excellent uh, uh, people who have led the Meiji Restoration, but uh, based Basically, with that basic assumption uh, being destroyed, uh, it became dysfunctional. That was my understanding. Then, of course, uh, the question is uh, how much uh, we uh, would attribute that to, to the MAG uh, Constitution. But I guess um, with the uh, a reform of the educational system, I think uh, uh, the effort was given uh, to develop the human resources during the major period. And in that educational uh, program, or the I think the vision was Uh, probably uh, focused on uh, training uh, uh, people who ha were able to learn uh, technology and skill, but uh, uh, not really based on uh, how to develop uh, human resources who can uh, really uh, contribute uh, to uh, the governance of the Japan as a country. I believe that there are no ifs in history, but if we can look back on, in those days and uh, uh, think about uh, 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 people, uh, if they had uh, more longer uh, visions, uh, would the Meiji Constitution be more functional and effective? To Professor Hatano, this is my question. I believe uh, uh, as a, a legacy of the negotiations of the treaty revisions, uh, I think uh, 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 the public was rather skeptical uh, with uh, the hard and uh, hardliners against uh, a foreign influence. But uh, one more point that I would like to raise. I think uh, you talked about uh, the uh, pragmatic uh, uh, behaviors uh, uh, being becoming more uh, dominant. Being f flexible enough and pragmatic enough uh, to uh, uh, respond to international uh, circumstances, why would Japan have gone to war? Uh, of course, uh, there have been much debate as to why Japan went to war, but 
uh, in the negotiations of the treaty revisions, if the Japan, Japanese government learned to be more pra pragmatic in behavior, why did Japan go to war, which would be, have been against being pragmatic? Would you please elucidate me on that point? And thank you very much for the question. I would like to respond to your question to me. Meiji Constitution, but this may not be a direct response to your question, but uh, the role of the emperor, or I believe there is uh, was a meaning in uh, the emperor not playing a role. Meiji, uh, Emperor Meiji uh, based himself on a constitutional monarchy and uh, that it was shared by uh, Emperor Showa. Uh, Emperor Meiji uh, became involved politically he, uh, only in three cases, including uh, the uh, expedition to Korea uh, uh, and uh, also Shimo but uh, otherwise, uh, I believe uh, uh, the emperor did not exercise its power at all. I think uh, uh, there were th three important uh, uh, cases of the, ex the explosion of John Jolin and also uh, February 26, and uh, also the case in which uh, the emperor uh, became so angry uh, so as to wanting to uh, lead the military himself. And also uh, when at the end of the war, Suzuki Kantaro, Prime Minister Suzuki Kantaro, uh, asked for the view of the emperor and the emperor decided uh, to end the war. And therefore, uh, the emperor reigns but not rule was the idea, but it was uh, the other way around in that case. I believe. And I believe there are two questions addressed to me, I believe. And a Meiji Constitution uh, was a, a very distributed system, and the, uh, the elder statesmen played important roles, but uh, uh, their power diminished. And uh, uh, the Gendo, or the elder statesmen, uh, were actual uh, people who led the Meiji Restoration. And uh, um, after all, Sayonji was the only person left among the group. Then why was it not possible to have a system uh, to uh, train human resources who can take over uh, their role? And the people who created Meiji and the leaders, I believe, uh, underwent the so-called uh, on-the-job training. And uh, in case of Sayonji, Maki no Shinken tra was trained under Sayonji, but it was rather limited in nature, and it was not organizational when we talk about uh, on-the-job training as such. The, uh, when the bureaucracy system uh, was uh, uh, came in place uh, with a civil servant exam um, put in place, uh, there were there was a system in place uh, to train uh, uh, capable uh, civil servants, but leaders to lead the uh, state was not trained so effectively, and I think that was true for Japan as well. As for uh, Japan's response uh, towards the, the outside, through the negotiations of treaty revisions, whether bilateral or multilateral in nature, I think uh, the Japanese negotiators uh, learned how to negotiate and uh, learned how to be flexible and to calculate various options. 
as they negotiated. And it was a passive attitude in a sense, but was consistent in nature. So uh, being a rather careful in uh, going through the negotiations, why was it that uh, uh, Japan went to war uh, starting from the Manchurian incident is, of course, a question that we need to think about. One reason that I can think of is that Uh, there was too much emphasis placed on a diplomacy conducted by the Foreign Affairs Ministry to take a unified approach to, to negotiate through the Foreign Ministry. That was the style taken at that time during Meiji and Taisho period. So, after the Manchurian incident, the armies, uh, in, army in China uh, created trouble, uh, leading to uh, diplomatic negotiations. Uh, but it was a negotiation between the armies overseas uh, in China, and uh, uh, there was to be no involvement of the foreign ministry. And uh, uh, by the uh, China incident period, uh, Foreign Affairs Ministry could not become involved in the negotiation at all, le leading to the uh, uh, Second uh, Sino-Japanese War. So judging from that uh, aspect, uh, Foreign Ministry It was rather pragmatic in its negotiations, giving emphasis on or placing emphasis on international uh, cooperation, adapting uh, to the environment. And I think they were consistent in that way. So that was one characteristic. Uh, but Uh, being too consistent uh, that the negotiation was to be carried uh, by, uh, by the foreign ministry also created problems. Thank you very much for the very important uh, comments. I am glad that I came here. About the constitutional monarchy, rather than the Meiji constitution, what I think is stronger in today's constitution is Under constitutional monarchy, how to select the top of the administration, the government, would be the big question. There could be a long uh, tradition that decides the procedures like uh, Britain, but in the case of Japan, what I think is good uh, that it is to be directly, indirectly selected by the population in the case of today's Japanese constitution. That was not clear in the Meiji constitution that the elder statesman Uh, would select by listening to the public opinion, but that was not a, a regulation. Uh, if uh, Konoe was considered to be respectable, he might have been chosen. So as a constitutional monarchy, that's a problem. And going back to the diplomacy, the people-to-people -people diplomacy or people's diplomacy, I think it could be a, a problem. So constitutional monarchy, the point is that uh, the monarch cannot elect uh, the top of the government, that uh, not supported by uh, the elderly statesmen, but uh, it should be the population, the ordinary people, elect the parliament, and the parliament chooses uh, the top of the government, meaning it is an indirect election by the population. That, I think, uh, was a successful change from Meiji to today's. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few minutes left, so we would like to open the floor for your questions or comments. Please do not be too long, so try to be short. If you have any uh, question, please kindly raise your hand and microphones will be brought to you. Yes, please. Thank you for the excellent discussion. So 150 years after the Meiji Restoration, 
we are looking back at the past well in half century. The reason why this is meaningful is because we're trying to think about the future of Japan, what Japan should be like in this century, in the 21st century. That is the reason why we are looking back at our own history. That's the important point. I don't think there was a direct reference to that kind of meaning because when the Soviet Union collapsed at the end of the last century, what would happen in the 21st century? At that moment, the majority of the opinion was that the United States would be the single largest power and 21st century would be the century of the U.S. I think both in and outside of our country, I think that was the majority. But as you look at President Trump appearing, what's going to happen? Is this going to be the century of the United States? There is a big question or a deep concern. Under this situation, as for Japan, what Japan ought to be like in this century? What would be the path, direction of Japan? Of course, a liberal democracy, freedom and democracy. That's an American ideology. And are we just going to transplant that ever since we were defeated by the US? Are we simply going to go the same path during this century? Is that the best? And China, like North Korea, it's a socialist democracy, as they call uh, themselves, uh, but uh, that's not a liberal community. They don't call themselves free or liberal, and China is obviously rising. So the relationship between China is another matter. So liberal democracy, is that all we want to claim as our direction? There are Europe and the US. We learned from the Western economies. That's the ideology that we learned in the last century. But when it comes to rising China and uh, Japan, uh, the relationship between a rising China, this I think would be critically important in this first half of this century. If you have any opinions, please. Thank you for the question. Uh, the reason why uh, we are holding this meeting is to think about what kind of uh, Japan do we want in our future. I agree with you. Uh, the topic is about Meiji restoration, modernization in Japan in a global context. The reason why we're looking back is, of course, because we want to think about the future. You are correct. So we are looking back at the history of Japan. Are there any lessons that we can remind ourselves? What lessons of the history could be useful for our future? That is the objective of this meeting, about the recognition, interpretation of history. Dr. Takubo has mentioned that uh, there was something uh, vague and unclear that we have dragged with us from after the war. I agree with you. But going forward, how to deal with that? And Professor Sakamoto mentioned this at the outset of his keynote. So this is exactly for the future of the Japanese ourselves. So under that viewpoint, we have co-organized today's event. You referred to the relationship between China. I am not a China expert, but what I can talk about, the economic growth of China, the rise of China, military expansion, and concomitantly Chinese influences rising in the global forum. How the global community as a whole can deal with uh, this. this, there are lots of discussions about China, including JIIA. A large number of think tanks are researching about how to deal with China, and uh, there are think tank to think tank international conferences, and indeed, China is uh, the hottest topic. One important topic is the country of China. It's not a democracy. 
overwhelming countries in the world are capitalist market with market economy and are democracies, and most of the countries have become richer. That has been the situation in the few decades. But a non-democratic country like China is rising, economically becoming richer, and their influence is expanding. And then, going forward, what will happen to the international order, how the order will change. Indeed, this is a big topic. It's not today's theme, but if I could sort of advertise, our institute is also covering discussions about China, and we hope to present and announce our findings in the future. So, liberal democracy... Uh, well, I refer to it, and when I look at international uh, context, uh, yes, the liberal democracy has been one of the mainstays. Uh, and it's not that all the countries in the world should uh, uphold uh, the liberal democracy, otherwise we cannot deal with them. Uh, I, I want to say that we would like to be friends with those states with uh, liberal democracy as friendly nations. Uh, and those who are not uh, liberal democratic nations, we uh, can uh, deal with them as good neighbors. Now about the United States. Uh, well, I don't think the United States can rule all over, all over the world. Uh, the world is so big. The uh, United States is a single uh, a power, but uh, they are not almighty. And so um, any control or any uh, uh, policing of the international order requires uh, not just the United States, but the United States and its allies. So I'm not really talking about um, and the possibility of the United States uh, uh, ruling or uh, controlling the international world order. And this is not just about the Trump administration. So I think time is up. Uh, with this, I'd like to end session one. Uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists and moderators for all their contributions. Thank you very much. Uh, panelists, uh, thank you very much. Uh, session two begins at 20 minutes to four. Thank you.